good to see you all. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce Gary Grath to you today. Um, I've been reading um, and uh, comics published by Gary, reading articles he's written, and learning from him, and learning about this wonderful comics medium from him for uh, probably longer than he cares to think about, actually. Um, it, uh, but um, Gary started out as a, a fanzine editor and uh, as a con organizer, um, and has since become, from those uh, beginnings, I would say one of the most influential and important figures um, in American comics as a scholar, critic, and publisher. Uh, in 1976, with his business partner, um, Michael, is it Catron? Catron. Michael Catron. Um, he took over a, an ad zine that was then called the Nostalgia Journal and remade it as the Comics Journal, which remains today the uh, premier flagship of comics criticism. Um, in the same year, he established uh, the publishing company Fantagraphics, uh, which uh, has given us the work of some of the most important um, creators of the last 20 years. The work, Hernandez brothers, Peter Bagg, um, uh, Dan Close, whose name I never pronounced right, is Klaus. that right? It's Klaus, Dan Klaus. Um, and uh, of course, a number of important historical imprints and reprints in recent years, including amongst other things, uh, the first comprehensive attempt to print all of Charles Schultz's Peanuts. Uh, all 50 years uh, coming out in very handsome editions from Fantagraphics. They're currently on, I believe, 1986. So they're 36 years into the 50 years. Um, and by the time it's finished, it will take up this much space on my shelf. It's a remarkable publishing achievement. Um, Gary also um, gave us one of the, uh, the great interviews that we have with Schultz. Um, when was that? What year was, was that? 97. In 97. Um, it's one of the most important interviews that we have with, with Schultz. Um, and he's uh, going to be talking more about um, uh, the creator that he, uh, uh, that he knows so well tonight for us. So uh, please join me in welcoming Gary Groth. Thank you. Um, I got to say, I cannot compete with that red jacket. <laughs> um, well, thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a real honor to be here. Uh, they asked me to talk about Peanuts, and I had to figure out how I was going to talk about Peanuts. Um, as Ben just said, I interviewed Charles Schultz in 1997. I also interviewed him in 1987. Um, so I got to know um, Charles Schultz. Um, and so I had to figure out how to do this. And basically, what I wanted to do was to put forth an argument that Charles Schultz is a great American artist. And um, that's how I put together this, um, this presentation. Um, and, and in order to do that, I want to I basically give you a survey of what comic strips were like before Peanuts, a very brief survey of what comic strips were like. Uh, the starting point is usually given as the Yellow Kid. Um, this was published in 19, uh, I'm sorry, 1896. Uh, the Yellow Kid originally appeared in 1895 in a magazine, then it appeared in a newspaper. And it's the first regularly published uh, strip in a newspaper with word balloons, with a recurring character. Um, and comic books can be, can, uh, comic strips can be traced um, before this, God knows, but this is a very good starting point um, for us here. And I tried to pick some, some art that was a little bit more interesting than, than just your, your standard um, newspaper strip. And so on the left-hand side, this is, a, this is an example of the Cats and Jammer Kids, um, which uh, started in uh, 1897. And uh, you'll notice on the left-hand side, uh, this is an original piece of work that the artist um, Rudolf Dirks hand-colored. Uh, for the colorist, on the right-hand side is a, is, a, is a printed strip, and you'll also notice on the on the um, on the strip on the left-hand side, it says the Shenanigan Kids written in script there, and that was because this was published during World War One, and there was a lot of anti-German sentiment. And they actually changed the title of it. Um, but comic strips back then were in several different um, different genres. There was kind of a domestic strip, uh, which I have examples of. There was there was ne'er there were ne'er do wells. 
such as Happy Hooligan. Uh, and again, the, the right-hand strip is a hand-colored original um, that the artist, Frederick Burr Oper, uh, hand-colored for the, for the, uh, for the colorist. Um, there were adventure strips and there were dazzling graphic strips, um, all of which I'll show. This is a great example of Mutt and Jeff. Um, this is from uh, the early 1900s. Uh, Bud Fisher drew this. And Mutt and Jeff was a, um, was a kind of ne'er-do-well husband who was always getting into trouble. And this is a, this is a great example of uh, Barney Google. And I chose one with the racehorse called Sparkplug. Um, as you can see, when um, Charles Schultz was born, his uncle uh, apparently nicknamed him Sparky after the uh, racehorse in Sparkplug, um, which, which goes to prove that everybody back then read newspaper strips and were aware of newspaper strips and were up on what was going on and, and followed them closely. A funny story, when, um, after I got to, uh, when, I, when I met Charles Schultz, of course, I called him Mr. Schultz, which I thought was only, was only proper to do. And, um, and I got to know him pretty well. Um, I think we got along really well. I think we liked each other. And I was on the phone, uh, and, and he told me at one point to call him Sparky, which I could not bring myself to do. <laughs> so we were, on, we were talking on the phone one, one afternoon, and I, I remember this vividly. Um, and I said something like, well, Mr. Schultz, blah, blah, blah. And he uncharacteristically interrupted me, and he very forcefully said, Sparky. And so from that moment on, I called him Sparky. Uh, this is a this is a uh, example of bringing up father. This is a classic. This is a classic example of the um, you know sort of uh, henpecked husband, the battle axe wife, uh, the husband who tries to get away with things, which have been you know which has been a template of, uh, of you know of humor of American humor um, throughout well from from at least uh, you know the early um, 20th century. An example of uh, Popeye by a great artist by the name of E.C. Seagar. Uh, and again, this was, uh, this was another strip that Charles Schultz read when he was a kid and loved. Uh, this is Skippy by Percy Crosby. This was a kid's strip, a big influence on, on Charles Schultz, although very, very much unlike uh, Peanuts and what Peanuts became. Um, this was a strip where um, Skippy was much more of a uh, street kid, a uh, much more naturalistic take, um, kind of a romanticized and naturalistic take um, on being a kid, um, but, but um, Schultz loved it. And this was Charles Schultz's favorite strip, and many of our favorite strips, Crazy Cat, um, by George Harriman. Uh, it's one of the most, most breathtakingly, beautifully drawn and poetic strips ever done. Um, when the Comics Journal did a top 100 comics and cartooning of the 20th century, we actually chose Crazy Cat as number one and Peanuts as number two. And Schultz told me he approved of that. <laughs> um, back in the um, first 30 years or so of the 20th century, um, the Sunday comics actually occupied the entire full tabloid page, and a tabloid was larger than a newspaper is today. And so it allowed the artist to do these incredibly dazzling graphics displays. This is an example of Little Nemo by Windsor McKay. And another stunning strip, Polly and Her Pals by Cliff Sterrett. Um, and again, the artist could, could, you know, could use that space and do something extraordinary with it which they can't do today. Um, here are a few strips that um, Schultz you know, actually pointed out that he read as a kid and you know, that affected his, his intense desire to become a cartoonist. Uh, Roy Crane, one of the great cartoonists and draftsmen, uh, he did a strip called uh, Captain Easy he did a strip called Wash Tubs. He later went on to do a strip called Buzz Sawyer. He was one of the great graphic artists and a terrific storyteller. Um, Captain Easy was a, uh, an adventure strip, and um, Buzz Sawyer, which he did during World War II, sort of evolved that um, into a more intense, more, more uh, realistic graphic strip, uh, adventure strip. 
And I thought this was a, a funny remark that, that Schultz made about um, Buck Rogers, and he was absolutely right. Um, it's a pretty second-rate strip, but of course, when he read it as a kid, he thought it was absolutely fabulous. It's one of those strips that dazzle you when you're 10 or 12. And this is an example of Flash Gordon by Alex Raymond. Just stunning, luscious work. It's the kind of work that seduces, that, that would have seduced someone of Charles Schultz's age, um, as would Prince Valiant by Hal Foster. Um, this was the kind of work that inspired so many cartoonists of Schultz's generation to become cartoonists. Milton Kniff, Terry and the Pirates. Um, this was an adventure strip. What Kniff sort of brought to comics was, um, you know, he took a lot from, from films of that era and translated that kind of noirish um, adventure atmosphere um, that films were tra uh, trucking in at the time. Again, very dramatically powerful and compelling strip. And Lil Abner by Al Cap. Al Cap was actually a contemporary of, of Schultz's. He was a little bit older, but uh, they were friendly colleagues and friendly competitors who knew each other. Um, and Al Cap actually said something really interesting about Peanuts, which I'll be, I'll be um, showing you soon. Uh, Charles Schultz's first professional gig was um, began in March 1946, lettering a comic called Topics for a St. Paul, Minnesota company um, that published Catholic comics. Uh, in July of 1946, he began a full-time job assessing student submissions at a correspondence school called Art Instruction in Minneapolis. And in the meantime, he was submitting uh, cart gag cartoons to magazines, which was really um, the most logical entree for being a cartoonist back then. He finally sold a four-page uh, gag page, uh, a four-panel gag page to Topics titled Just Keep Laughing. This lasted exactly two installments before it was canceled. And undeterred, he kept knocking on doors. Uh, finally, the St. Paul Pioneer Press, a small, pa uh, small paper in, in St. Paul, accepted a weekly gag page titled Little Folks. Um, this began in June 1947. Um, Schultz was thrilled to get this gig, even though it was buried in the women's section in the back of the paper, and he was only paid $10 a week for it. Um, but you can certainly see the beginnings of Peanuts in this strip. Now, after a year of writing uh, and drawing little folks, Schultz finally achieved his dream he sold his first cartoon to the Saturday Evening Post, which was, which was a major magazine at the time. He would go on to sell 16 more between 1948 and 1950. Um, his confidence, boosted by his sales of the Post, Schultz asked the editor of the St. Paul um, Pioneer Press to start running his gag panel daily. And the editor said he wouldn't. Um, Schultz then asked if he, could be, if he could run on Sunday instead of during the week, and he said, the editor said no. Uh, he then asked for a raise, and the editor said no. <laughs> and um, now Charles Schultz had an incredibly vivid memory, um, and this fueled Peanuts. Um, his memory of, um, he, had, he had an incredible memory for humiliation, and he has a funny anecdote about that story. Um, years later, he would remember vividly, he said, when the editor said, he would not give him a raise, he wouldn't, give a, he wouldn't change the location of the strip. Schultz said, um, well, perhaps I should just quit drawing it. And the editor matter-of-factly replied, all right. And years later, Schultz remembered, he said, I'll never forget that. He just said, all right. And that was the end of my career with the St. Paul Pioneer Press. So he quit doing that strip and he kept submitting strips um, to syndicates. Um, he would take a train to Chicago go to the NEA syndicate, make the rounds. Um, he finally went to New York um, to United Feature Syndicate. In 1950, uh, he saw an editor there, and um, they accepted 
they finally accepted the strip, they became peanuts. Um, now, he hated the term peanuts. He did not want uh, the strip to be called peanuts, but they insisted. And these are the first three strips that appeared. The strip drive started running on October 2nd, 1950. Um, these three strips, I think, are illustrative of, of at least the first couple of years of the strip. Um, the first one, of course, illustrates what would become a theme throughout 15 years, 50 years, which is Charlie Brown's sense of rejection, people's rejection of him, his isolation, his alienation. Um, the second strip um, represents a kind of battle of the sexes which occupied the strip for a couple of years, um, and only for a couple of years, uh, but it was quite prominent. Um, he actually did a number of strips relating to male-female relationships couched in, in Peanuts terms. And then the third strip represents something else he mastered, which was just the gag strip. Now, I think it's important to place Peanuts in its cultural context. Um, the 1950s are seen in retrospect as kind of Eisenhower decade. Culturally, they're looked upon as being kind of staid, bland, um, I mean, politically, we were uh, in the Cold War, and they were sort of, and, and culture was sort of um, represented by things like uh, Ozzie and Harriet, uh, Father Knows Best, Leave It to Beaver, the Donna Reed Show, it was represented by John Wayne movies and Doris Day movies, um, sort of bland, innocuous entertainment. But on the other hand, both Gary Trudeau and Jules Fife are absolutely correct. Because there was this kind of alternative culture popping up. Uh, Mad Magazine started in 1952 as a comic book under the direction of Harvey Kurtzman. Uh, the Beats started in, 19, in the 1950s. Jack Kerouac, Ginsburg. Um, Elvis Presley started in the later 1950s. Uh, Hugh Hefner started Playboy in 1954. Uh, and there were some great comedians that were all starting to come up in the 1950s. Um, Sid Caesar, um, Stan Freeberg, and a brilliant comedian by the name of Ernie Kovacs, who were injecting the culture with a, kind of, with a new kind of humor that Americans had not seen before. And there were also older comedians like Jack Benny and Phil Silvers who were doing extraordinary work on television. And I think Peanuts is solidly within that kind of alternative cultural framework. Um, Two examples, two very, very early examples in the first year of the strip. And the other thing that separated Schultz from all of the, cart all, all the newspaper strips that went before him was that he put himself on the page. I mean, the whole strip was about his own internal crisis, his own existential being. And that's not, I don't, I don't think that's hyperbolic. I think he actually put himself on the page in a way that no newspaper cartoonist um, with the possible exception of George Harriman, did. These are the strips that, you know, kind of gave Peanuts its reputation as an intellectual strip, as, a, as an interior strip, um, as a strip that dealt with difficult issues, difficult private issues. I mean, that second strip is just incredibly, I mean, incredibly naked in terms of Schultz's, I don't even want to use the word psyche, but I, I think more of his existential self. Um, and of course, one of the hallmarks of Peanuts is that it explored loneliness. Um, and one of the things I tried to do here was to not only talk about the themes of Peanuts, but to give you a sense of Charles Schultz as a human being and how 
his being, how his humanity inflected the strip. So it's not just Schultz talking about his comic and about his art, but always revealing something about himself. Um, I did kind of pursue this, this line of questioning and try to nail him down here, but he had, you know, he had, he had a very kind of schizophrenic attitude about his own achievements. Sometimes he could be very, very um, aware of where he resided, I think, in the, in the artistic spectrum and took a great deal of pride, but, on the, uh, but, but his, his aversion to this seemed also very genuine. Um, here are just a handful of strips that explore the, the idea of loneliness. And the thing about Schultz is that he was actually, he was able to universalize this so much. I mean, look at that, that, that first story. I probably, I probably wouldn't fit in. I probably wouldn't fit in there. Um, which, I don't know about you, but I certainly... <laughs> and then the second one, God knows, is a, you know, kind of a lifelong <laughs> struggle. And then the third one is just brutal. Uh, and and th th that last one really is brutal. Um, and Schultz got less harsh over the years, um, I think very deliberately. But I think these early strips are, are, are very, very important because it reveals what the 20, 29, 28, 28, 29, 30 year old Charles Schultz felt. I'm throwing that on the page. Um, well, let me see. He got married. Um, it would have been around 50. Ben would have been 54, 53, maybe even. Could have been earlier. There was. I don't think he was married. He wasn't married when he did the, early, the first year of the strips. So it was. It was. It was early on in the strip. Although, I I can't really say that that mitigated. <laughs> <laughs> the loneliness he expresses on the page. Um, this I thought was funny because at first I thought, I, I was thinking of labeling this as Schultz versus Schultz, but I realized no, it isn't. It's just simply two sides of the same man. Um, the first one I think illustrates what he's striving to be. I mean, at least knowing him as I did, knowing the work as I do, um, I think that's a, a, a decent interpretation. And the second one, of course, is as he is. Um, now the early, the early strips especially, and I should probably mention that all of my examples are from the first um, 10 years of the strip, and I did that for two reasons. One is I didn't think I had the time to read 50 years of strips and do them justice and select um, um, an arc that covered the 50 years. Ben told me recently he did exactly that, so I felt like a real slacker. But, um, <laughs> um, but then I found really everything I needed in those first 10 years. In fact, I had like three times as many of these. Uh, these. I mean, there's so many good strips, so many great examples um, of what he was doing. Um, anyway, both of these, um, both of these quotes are, are accurate. Um, I actually quoted him, Al Cap's quote, and asked him what he thought of it. And um, the only reason I didn't, I didn't reproduce that here is because he sort of evaded the question. He, and I only realized that after I went back and, and reread it. But, um, but it's quite true, um, you know, th and, and this probably did end um, in that first decade. Um, but there was a, a great deal of cruelty in, in Peanuts. I mean, cruelty toward Char little, you know, Charlie Brown. <laughs> One of his, uh, one of Charles Schultz's refrains was, uh, that's the way it goes. And I can't help but think that Schultz was very much a part of the zeitgeist in the 50s. Um, I don't think it's too grandiose to draw a comparison between um, Samuel Beckett and Charles Schultz. Um, so much of Schultz's work reminds me of Beckett's, uh, I can't go on, I'll go on. <laughs> I 
Now, Schultz, of course, um, he eased up on Charlie Brown later on. <laughs> this is both subtle and brutal at the same time. And this is just so savage. If you read this, this, this whole thing carefully, it's just Lucy going through this grotesque, <laughs> um, detailed explanation. You know, of why Charlie Brown is dull and boring. This is the last of. <laughs> and that second strip is just. Um, and of course, you know, the artistry here is in the pacing, the rhythms of the panel. I mean, look at Charlie Brown's face in that very last panel. Um, it's probably a lot more difficult to do than it looks like. Um, in, fact, in fact, cartoonists have told me that it's so hard to draw Charlie Brown that it looks very easy, but it's really, really hard to, um, to, get, <laughs> to get that head exactly right because it's spherical but not quite. Um, and here's an exchange I had with him where he, you know, he, he does open up a little bit about his cruelty. And where he talks about how he eased up. And again, when I, I've interviewed probably a couple of hundred cartoonists. And um, many of them are very practiced. Uh, many of them have form answers. Um, but there was something incredibly authentic and genuine about, about Schultz. And I think this illustrates that. He couldn't, he couldn't be inauthentic. Um, now the strip was cruel, but it was also incredibly bleak. And uh, I just have a few examples of the strips that I considered not merely cruel, but just incredibly bleak to the uh, almost nihilistic. Um, I mean, I think that first strip sort of expands the universe beyond Charlie Brown to the, you know, entire human race. And that second one might sum up. <laughs> I mean, that's why he started sleeping on top of the dog. Huh? Um, now, Shul, it was one thing that uh, um, uh, another great cartoonist, a friend of mine by the name of Gayon Wilson, once told me is that um, Peanuts was not about kids. It wasn't a kid strip. And he was absolutely right. Schultz used the kids in Peanuts to make contemplative, adult, philosophical commentary. Um, and he was intensely interested in, uh, in, in this. He was a lifelong reader. And here are a few strips that I think illustrate, you know, his more philosophical bent and how he used the kids. Um, take a look at the second strip. What I found interesting about this is how Charlie Brown, the first panel, is in this typical kind of kid's posture. Um, but if you look at the last panel, he's leaning on that, talking on the phone, exactly as an adult would. And the, la and the last strip is probably something he's, you know, he, he, he's either said or wanted to say to numerous um, people. <laughs> I, find the I find the second strip particularly moving um, and universal because we probably always, you know, we probably all had 
the desire to do something, but somehow not the will, and I think he felt that very deeply. And of course, this is something he wrestled with his entire life, with his um, sort of love-hate relationship with the art of cartooning, um, which he felt, my impression was he felt very bitter that the status of cartooning was what it was in his lifetime. Although he himself would denigrate it on occasion. Now, that first one is pretty <laughs> revealing. And of course, the whole concept of happiness would haunt him throughout his life. Um, one of the things I love about Peanuts is that there is this kind of quixotic nature to Charlie Brown. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine, a cartoonist who I respect a great deal, and she told me that she could, just couldn't get into Peanuts because it was all about defeat. And uh, she was not about defeat. She didn't sort of accept that premise. And after all, I thought she had it wrong, that it was not only about defeat, but it was about resilience in the face of defeat. So I have a handful of strips here that I think demonstrate um, that kind of quixotic journey um, in Peanuts and, and Schultz's own. I mean, here, of course, Charlie Brown simply will not give up, will not leave, and he has faith. <laughs> um, and, of course, he extended that quixotic nature to Snoopy on occasion. Um, I found that the, the, the last tier, the third tier of the strip, just great. I mean, the look on his face in the first panel, I mean, as, as regresses, just his intense need to stop this from happening. And of course, um, you know, setting up a football. And of course, the fact that he does this over and over again every year um, is proof that he's willing to try. What, one of my purposes here is to show um, just how, how much he mastered the cartooning form. I mean, how many different forms within the cartooning form he mastered. Um, he was good at so many different things. He was good at telling stories, but he was also great at, at gag cartoons, um, which, of course, he started out doing. He started out, um, uh, and, and which he loved, uh, and, and which were much more prevalent back then. Um, but he was also a first-rate gag cartoonist. And here are a few examples. His gags were, I mean, his gags were often, you know, they were better than gags. They were, they were smart. Um, I mean, they're not, you know, and they were quirky, too. He could be, I mean, he wasn't just... Um, <laughs> The second one is like a little miniature tour de force of screwball confusion. Um, Schultz was not apolitical exactly, but um, he did not want to do a political strip. He sort of disdained politics in cartooning and comic strips. 
Um, he was not ideological. Um, and I tried to nail him down on what his politics really were, and I don't know, the best I could come up with was maybe he was a Rockefeller Republican. Um, but I found just a handful, literally, I think, uh, six examples of politics that intruded into the strip in the 1950s. Um, and here are a few. They're not political per se, but they're just slightly tinged with political awareness. Uh, the second one is kind of chilling because, uh, of course, uh, Vietnam was right around the corner. Um, and of course, the first one, you know, certainly isn't ideological, and it's not necessarily political per se, but it does indicate a certain aversion, um, you know, to large institutions. And that last one, uh, I was talking to Ben earlier about this, I mean, it's, a, it's kind of a harrowing, um, it's, it's sort of harrowing in its casual demeanor. This is, of course, during the Cold, Cold War, it's when we were um, we were under the threat of a possible nuclear annihilation. And this next one is even better. When I was rereading all the peanut strips, I hadn't remembered this. <laughs> so it doesn't hit you until the last panel. <laughs> yes, I think it's 1957. Um, these are some of, my, some of my favorite peanut strips. Um, you know, peanuts was not only about you know about Schultz and alien, about about his own alienation and sense of isolation. Um, he could be incredibly playful. And I mean, things were just. I mean, he engaged in this absurdist humor. It was also reflected in the culture at large. These are some of my some of my favorite surreal. Examples. Well, I can't tell you exactly, but I think it was 19, it was either 50 or 51. Yeah. It might have been 19, it might have been 1950. No, no, it was probably early 51. But I mean, that is just so bizarre, you know, you reread some of these strips and you go, what was he, like, what was he thinking? Like, what Did was... He ever do anything that you wrote that again with well, well, you know, I mean, Snoopy became sort of more human, but no, nothing quite as surreal as that. I don't think so. I don't think so. But you know, it's also when he was first, when he, when he was learning how to do the strip, um, and you know, whenever whenever a cartoonist, uh, I think probably whenever an artist starts doing something like this, but it's most pronounced in cartoonists because you can see this, you know, virtually day to day, week to week, month to month progression. Um, they don't know what they're doing. They're 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 practicing. They're experimenting. And I think that probably accounts for it. You know, he would never do that probably five years later, yeah. much less 25 years later. <laughs> and you wouldn't know from his demeanor, which was exceedingly genteel and courteous and low key, um, that he would quite be capable of these you know, this level of wackiness. I love the first one. Well, actually I love all of them, but th this was one of a, a longer series of strips where it went on and on about, um, <laughs> about the sons and how frustrated Charlie Brown was that she didn't understand this. And um, in the 50s, he did have a running gag where Lucy would just say the most outrageous thing and things, and Charlie Brown would realize that they were preposterous and um, just be so frustrated, and, and Lucy would regard him as, as just being foolish. But what a great idea that the Earth is getting smaller because too many people are walking on it.
And that third panel in the second strip was just, I mean, what, ins <laughs> what inspired him to do that? And then that last strip, I still can't figure out like how he came up with it, what it, you know, <laughs> it's just inspired. <laughs> And this is probably, I'm sorry I didn't date them, but I, 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 I didn't have the time to actually go back and put this whole thing together myself. It's a miracle it was, uh, I even did that, but it was probably around 57. And then the first one is just this great <laughs> surreal gag strip. <laughs> and I believe, Ben, you picked the, the second strip for, for the exhibit. I think I saw that down there. <laughs> no? Okay. One of his whirly, whirly gigs. I have the, 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 I have an ear gag one. Okay. The back, uh, okay. The that's right, that's right. <laughs> now, this is a, such a great example of the art of cartooning. It's purely visual. Only a cartoonist could think of something like that last panel as the, as the punchline. And, and what a great funny drawing of Peanuts in the last panel. <laughs> and again, this is just nuts. <laughs> It all builds up to that second panel, the last panel being uncharacteristically anticlimactic. <laughs> and of course, completely uncharacteristic of Charlie Brown, who usually yeah. does not have uh, that sharp a. Uh, and another thing I loved about Peanuts um, is that he just loved to draw, you know, panel to panel sequences. And so much of Peanuts, is um, is very staid panel to panel. I mean, you have you have you have characters who are leaning against uh, uh, you know up against a, uh, a concrete uh, wall, just talking. Well, sometimes he would just let loose, and there's such great beauty to. Um, I mean, you can just see the kind of joy he had. Drawing strips like this. Almost always Sunday strips, which gave him the room he needed. Great velocity here. Um, he had a motif here where, um, where Snoopy would just, um, would just go after poor Linus. But this one time, Linus got the better of him. This is the only time I know I found. <laughs> and again, I think you can see this is the work of a younger man. He was in his 30s when he did these. Oh, and I just love how he was able to connote movement um, with, with just the the most minimal line work. You know, Snoopy whooshing back and forth, especially in that last tier. <laughs> and of course, um, I mean, Schultz was a great writer. He was a great um, writer for cartooning. I think he was a really adequate writer when he wrote um, short essays and so forth. But I mean, his writing was just so perfectly suited for cartooning. Um, but sometimes um, his writing sort of transcended what was required for cartooning. And here are just a couple of examples of that, where I think that the, the writing came center stage. Uh, 
Um, the, fir the, the first strip is uh, an example of um, Charlie Brown getting the better of, um, of Patty um, um, or Lucy or Violet early in the, in the first decade of the strip. He stopped doing that, of course, and within, I don't know, four or five years. But he would often get the better of them, and they would go after him because of that. Um, and of course, I don't think that um, Peanuts can be seen as kind of one-dimensional strip, which was only about, you know, the sadness of Charlie Brown. There was a great joy in Peanuts, and there was obviously a great joy um, in Charles Schultz. There was that side to him, and I wanted to make sure we displayed that. So my favorite strips that just unadulterated love of life. Um, I think I just had to include the quintessential. Um, I wanted to bring it up to date and just explain a little bit about uh, my relationship to Charles Schultz. Um, I interviewed him for a magazine that we published called Nemo in 1987. And um, I was not terribly prepared because I went with a great comic book histor a comic strip historian by the name of Rick Marshall, who was doing the primary interview, and I tagged along for the ride. And ever since then, I wanted to do a really proper interview with Schultz. Um, so in 1997, um, I arranged to do an interview with him. I called him up, asked him if I could do it, go, dry, uh, go down to uh, Santa Rosa to his studio. And um, he said that would be that would be okay. I went down to his studio, um, spent a long day with him. I read every peanut strip I could find at that time, which were all these uh, miscellaneous collections that, that were not complete. But I read every every strip I could I could uh, read, and I took copious notes. And I went down there and did a very very long interview with him, um, which I think is good. But now when I reread it, ten you know every time I ask a question, ten more questions come into my mind, saying why didn't I ask him these questions? Um, anyway, when we were, when we were um, at his ice rink, he, uh, he built an ice rink um, across from his studio. Um, and we were sitting in his ice rink in the coffee shop talking after the interview. And I brought up the possibility, I said, somebody, you know, should reprint all of your strips, thinking that somebody should be me. And at first he poo-pooed the idea. He said, ah, you know, who would want to read all those strips? He just didn't think it was a good idea. And so I talked to him and talked to him, and he finally said, okay. And I said, you know, I think we could, you know, we would be the ones to do this. We could do it with the kind of care and consideration that it needs. And he said, well, you know, you say, he said, if you want to do it, you have my blessing, you know, go right ahead. And, you know, talk to the syndicate about it. Um, this is the, uh, the interview I did with him appeared in the Comics Journal. And um, I spoke to him a number of times after that interview on the phone. Oh, one, one funny story is that after the interview appeared, I sent him a copy of the magazine, and of course I hoped he liked how it turned out. Interview subjects don't always like how their interviews turn out. Um, but uh, I got, um, this was before, um, this was in 97. So it's before we had a very sophisticated voicemail system in our office. And um, I got a note on my desk one day I was out that afternoon, but I got a note on my desk. Somebody left a, uh, a note, someone in my office left a note. It just said, um, he wanted you to know he liked the interview, signed Sparky. <laughs> and the person in my office who took the message did not know who that was. He just thought it was like some guy named Sparky who called up to thank me for the interview. Um, but of course, I, I spoke to him subsequently, and he thought you, you know, he, he liked how it turned out. We spoke on the phone, not infrequently. And... Um, and before I had a chance to actually um, arrange to publish The Complete Peanuts, um, he very unexpectedly died in the year of 2000. And after a while, I still wanted to do it. Um, so I called his wife, his widow, Jeannie, and I broached the subject with her. I told her I talked to Sparky about it. He was, you know, he was in favor of it and ultimately gave her a presentation. And... Um, 
and she was the one um, who really ramrodded this project through, cut through all the red tape. I wanted to end it with, with her. There was one more slide, but I, I, I wanted to um, pay tribute to Jean Schultz. Um, she has really done a tremendous amount to honor Charles Schultz's legacy. Um, she's just done a fabulous job of, of um, she, she understands his work, she understands um, how important it is. And she was instrumental in making the Complete Peanuts happen. Um, without her, I am not entirely sure the syndicate would have given us the rights to do that. And I wanted to end this, well, I didn't want to end it with an advertisement, but that is, the, uh, that is a, a, a boatload of Complete Peanuts covers that we've done. And I wanted to end it with this strip, just because it's such a great strip with um, uncharacteristic self-assurance on the part of Charlie Brown. It struck me as um, quite beautiful and quite revealing of a certain side of Charles Schultz. And that is, that is it. Um, I'm more than happy to if anybody has any questions. But how could you, really? This is so devastatingly complete. Yes. Oh yes, yes. You, you mean in the in the books? Well, no, I mean just during his lifetime, all these years. Mm -hmm. How does someone keep Oh well, you know the um, well the 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 the, uh, the Schultzes. I mean, they have the, of course. I think in the 50, late fifties, early sixties, he had his start his own company um, called Creative Associates, and uh, they did a very very good job of archiving all of his strips. We get, we get almost all of the strips straight from them. There were handfuls of strips that we had to find elsewhere. Um, but they actually, over the years, over many, many years, I don't, I don't know if they didn't, they didn't start doing this until possibly the 70s, but they started archiving all of his strips, which you know most artists and most syndicates don't do. So it's often very, very hard to find strips. But in this case, it was relatively easy. Only in the first decade or so did we have trouble finding strips. Well, you know what? I think there were about three that needed touch-up or something like that, which our designer, Seth, who was a, was a very good, great cartoonist in his own right, um, he actually had to redraw uh, an initial panel, the one panel, right, right, uh, a golf panel. Oh, yes. Um, me, as well as a lot of people in our introduction to comics class, we're doing this yeah. essay on peanuts. And so I heard. And is a comparative essay between Snoopy and other newspaper comic book villains. Like Marley, like Mutz, and, yeah. and well, countless others. Yeah. Um, I want to hear uh, your opinions of how Snoopy kind of changed, almost completely into a human character. Evolved. Yeah. Well, I think I mean I think Snoopy represented Schultz's fantasy life, and so he imbued Snoopy with that ability to um, to represent you know whatever fantasies Charles Schultz himself had. Um, I mean, he started off you know initially the first year he was a dog he walked on all fours, and it was just it was a slow anthropomorphic evolution. Um, I mean, I forget what year he actually started thinking. Was that 53? Something. It's one really weird early example, and it doesn't happen right. And it doesn't right happen for right years. for a long time, right, yeah. right. Because it's, it's like that. It's like one in, in 52 or 53, and then it's about 56 that he starts doing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think it was just, I mean, I, I think this was a work in progress, you know, up until the day he died. Um, and... And Snoopy did serve the function of being the character who was possibly the most mutable. I mean, that probably doesn't help you with your paper, but... Actually, it does. Okay. Um, with a work as large as, you know, yeah. Peanuts, uh, there are countless opportunities for other artists to be able to in, uh, connect with it and also, in, in many ways, expand on it. Like, yeah. for example, um, you have 
you're a good man, Charlie Brown, the musical, and then you have the television series, and then you have um, um, uh, the, the play, Dog Sees Dog. Um, did, how did Schultz feel about those people who wanted to, you know, latch on and, and you know, take part in, in that? Um, he was really proud <clears throat> of all this, other, uh, of, of Peanuts being in other media. He was incredibly pr pr proud of the play. Um, that apparently did really, really well in New York and Broadway. Um, I think that was the six. Well, it was, it, it, there was one in the 60s. Yeah, uh, there was 60, 66, 67, and then 71. Right, and he was really proud of that. He loved the TV specials. Um, I mean, he worked on them. He wrote them. Um, so he was very much a participant in them. Um, and, you know, he reveled in, in Peanut's success in other media. And, I mean, I, I mean, I think he was very, very gratified. And he never saw he never saw Peanut's success in other media, and he never saw any of the merchandising um, as diluting um, his vision in the Peanut strips. Um, he made a point of saying that he never did anything in the Peanut strips that he would not have done otherwise without without all the merchandising. And one, I mean, one funny thing. I mean, there were, you know, there was. I mean, you know, he was a very complex person, very complex artist. When I was interviewing him the first time in 87, he, was, he complained to us that Peanuts was seen as a kid's strip. That is, that it was seen as a strip that kids would like because he considered it to be a strip that adults should like and that adult, adults should read and appreciate. And I was, um, I was sympathizing with him. And then after the interview, um, he took us over to, um, um, I, I think it was a skating rink, and he showed us, he went, we went up, went up to the second floor, and the second floor was this, practically this museum of Peanuts merchandise. I mean, there were Peanuts beach balls and Peanuts, you know, figurines and stuffed toys. I mean, it was just, it was a room bigger than this room filled with Peanuts merchandise. And I remember thinking, which I think, which I think in retrospect might be a little too harsh, but I was thinking, well, you're surprised that Peanuts is seen as a kid's strip. Well, I mean, 99% of the merchandise, of course, is aimed at kids. Um, but he did not see, you know, he did not see any problem with that. I mean, he actually liked all the merchandise. He approved of all the merchandise. He was pretty careful about all that. Right, right, right. Well, my my impression is, I mean, I showed an earlier, I showed a strip that was in the you know, mid '50s, that I thought resembled a little bit of some of his drawing in the '90s. Um, it was a little, I mean, from I don't know, from something like '68 or '70. Um, through a, in, through the late '80s or so, I think he, he it, there was there was a um, there was a template to his line work. He was very very proud of his of his penmanship. Um, he really valued line work, and I think he established himself at some point, and then just you know I mean that was that was the look he had. He had a complete control of his pen, um, and he did it. Now the early strips you can see are you know kind of rudimentary. He's still finding his voice visually as well as conceptually. Um, now, sometime in the, in the 80s, um, and I think there's, I think there's a, a medical term for this, but his right, his right hand started shaking. And he couldn't, he couldn't do the line work as well, which he regretted very much. Um, and if you blow up some panels from the late 80s and 90s, you can actually see where the line is scalloped and he just couldn't, do a, he couldn't draw a perfect line anymore. Um, so you had, I think, a kind of physical deterioration um, from the late 80s until his death. But you know, he was such a good artist and he was such a good craftsman that there was, you know, it was still a beautifully drawn strip irrespective of that physical deterioration. Um, he told me a funny story once where he said, um, people who were trying to duplicate peanuts for merchandising purposes would look at his strips when his hands started to shudder, and they would try to duplicate <laughs> the scallop line, which he did not want them to do. Um, 
But that's roughly how I see it. I mean, I think he like mastered it maybe, you know, maybe as early as the late 50s, but certainly by, you know, this by, the, by the early 60s. Do you know when he abandoned the Beatles? I was earlier. Do you know when he stopped penciling? I don't know when he stopped penciling. In fact, I thought, you know, I thought, I mean, I probably, I could have misunderstood him, but I thought he, he never, pen like, he was very proud of the fact that he did not pencil when I talked to him. Mm -hmm. And he said he just went straight to ink, and I guess he wanted that kind of spontaneity. Right. 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 Yeah, he didn't need to. Which is which is very unusual. Uh, most cartoonists, I mean, almost every cartoonist I know pencils, and then they ink. Um, the only other cartoonist I know who doesn't do that is Ralph Steadman. He thought it was just weird that a cartoonist would do that. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, did Schultz get involved in the, um, in the in the cartoonist associations? He was you know, he was deeply involved in the Rubens uh, in, in the Ruben Awards in the National Cartoonist Society uh, for a while. Um, but you know when I spoke to him, um, he somehow seemed a bit disenchanted with the cartooning community, and I, you know I don't think that he was ever close to many cartoonists. I mean, one of his closest friends was, was Lynn Johnson. Um, but I don't think he was the kind of person to pal around with many cartoonists, strangely enough. Huh? Yeah. Right. Um, I wonder if you had any comment on Any insight on that? Yeah. You know, I don't. I mean, I, I wouldn't pretend to have an insight in, the, in, in that. My, my impression um, is that uh, Joyce, you know, knew her mind. Um, you know, she was a very strong woman. I mean, Jean is too. Um, so I don't... You know, I, 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 I don't know how, I mean, obviously everything you see in Peanuts is a part of, of Schultz, but on the other hand, I think it's, um, I think it's dangerous to, um, to draw too close a parallel. I mean, there's, there's sort of too much going on in there to draw too much of a cause and effect, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do that. So if there aren't any more questions, um, I thank you very much. Thank you.